Michelle, do you There's, want to respond to some of well, these um, before we go? I, you know, <laughs> Jake and I very seldom disagree on anything, so I'll probably just be echoing more what he said than, than uh, providing any kind of a different perspective. Uh, and thank you for going back through that painful history of Basel, too. That, that was awful. Um, we uh, and and uh, the irony on uh, when they were we were being driven and we really the FDIC was really isolated on this so we we had the the, the Congress was after us the Fed was after us the SEC was after us the big banks were after us Michael Bloomberg was after us Chuck Schumer's I mean everybody was just you know you've got to uh, go along with this and we we held out and didn't. And but the, the quantitative impact study. So we did it. The, the regulators had done a study uh, to see what the impact would be of, of the Basel II advance, what they called the Basel II advanced approaches. And there were eye popping uh, capital <laughs> reductions. Even keeping the leverage ratio, there was still going to be uh, eye popping capital reductions, especially. The weight on mortgages was great. Oh, uh, yeah, especially mortgages. I mean, WAMU was, would, have, would have been, we would have, that would have been a very expensive failure if we'd let uh, an institution like WAMU go on this. Uh, so it's really. Uh, intellectual capture is right, and it, it does get back to that regulators starting to see the world through the eyes of, of the entities they regulate, and um, so misguided. Uh, and I, it frustrates we just can't get rid of it completely, but I think we will, the leverage ratio is, is um, not only are we keeping the leverage ratio in the U.S., but I think we're going to significantly see it significantly strengthened, uh, hopefully in the next several weeks. And so that's, that, that is, that's a success story uh, on reform, I think. Um, Everything you said on resolution planning is absolutely right. Uh, there needs to be much greater public disclosure of what the resolution plan is. Uh, the, the priority of claims is, uh, is a problem if uh, a couple things. I think in the near term, this is a viable strategy to use uh, to take control of the holding company. And right now, there's probably enough uh, unsecured debt and equity at the holding company level of most of these institutions to absorb losses if one of them should fail. But uh, when people start figuring out that the strategy will be if these institutions fail, that the holding company stakeholders are going to take the losses, and if you invest in subsidiary, you're going to be okay, they're going to all start wanting to invest in subsidiaries. So the regulators have to have very strict minimum capital and debt requirements at the holding company level to make sure there's going to be abs uh, adequate loss absorbing capacity. And this is another example where I think industry itself should be working for reform because under Dodd-Frank, and I tend to believe Dodd-Frank means what it says, and if there's a failure, and if that debt and equity is not sufficient to cover the losses associated with the failure, the rest of the industry is going to pay for it, taxpayers or not. It's very specific. It's, a, it's an assessment, a deep, it could be very substantial assessment on the rest of the industry to pay for this. So I would assume if people look at this, believe Dodd-Frank, what it says, it would be in the industry itself heightened self-interest, enlightened self-interest. Except they're self looking at it in the context of an era where regulators were, shall we say, very good at That's right. That well, and that's the problem. That's yeah. the problem. So regulators themselves need to be quite firm and direct on this, and that it's the bailouts aren't happening, and, uh, and uh, convincing the industry of that to get with the program. Um, the trigger point, I absolutely agree with that, too. I mean, we struggled with uh, the trigger, uh, triggering a, a bank failure uh, is, is very difficult. And we have something called prompt corrective action, which basically says if you get below 2% capital, you have 90 days to recapitalize, you're going to be closed. But even that, I think, it forced us to wait too long. And the, the problem is with the sick institution, Everybody knows it's sick. You know, regulators, they're not fooling anybody. You think, oh, we're going to camouflage city problems or whatever. They know they're sick. And so you start seeing good bank customers leaving. You start seeing, you know, all the unsecured debt that will absorb losses if a failure. That starts to run if it's short term. And the franchise value just starts to deteriorate. And the longer you wait, the more expensive that failure is going to be and the more potentially disruptive. One of the best so, examples of that, incidentally, is Citibank that had, I think, the highest of the SIFI capital ratios at the very time its share value had fallen to a dollar share. Sure. Yeah, 50. yeah. So, so it, and it, it, it needs to be a market-based trigger, too, one that, the, yeah. one that cannot be uh, the regulators or the bank managers cannot manipulate. I, I think that's right. And, and again, the Shadow Committee and Dick have done a uh, really good work in that area. Uh, the market for corporate control, again, it just oh, we need more market discipline for these institutions. And I agree, uh, regulations themselves have inhibited the ability of, of uh, those who specialize in this kind of uh, you know, hostile takeovers and, and restructurings uh, to even get their foot in the door. And so uh, and bank regulators have been uh, hostile themselves to this because uh, I think they view this as, as a source of instability. And uh, But, you know, what it's done is insulate these very large institutions from any kind of market accountability. 
Um, so I, I think they need to look at that again. It would be nice if the boards themselves, I mean, there's a lot of analysis out there. I mean, it you, you doesn't, that shows that these institutions are very likely, they're worth more in pieces than they are together. And the boards themselves should be leading this. The boards represent shareholders. They have fiduciary obligations to shareholders. I wish they wouldn't wait for, you know, an activist to come in and try to force it. Get ahead of it now. Uh, you know, be a leader. Uh, you know, break them up. Uh, release a fifty hundred billion dollars of, of share value for your your stakeholders and and uh, be a hero. But uh, they're not. You know, they're batting down the hatches and trying to protect themselves at this point. Uh, but but there may be some uh, that are, are more open to it than others. So I think at least doing the analysis is really a, should be an obligation of the board. I love the idea on taxing uh, legal entities. Uh, make it uneconomic. Uh, I, you know, I think there, there's maybe a governance role. I know as a European bank I was talking to that has a smaller number of legal entities, and I, I called them and asked them why, and they said, well, our executive committee and our board has to approve every single new legal entity they have. So with some of these other mega institutions, just about anybody, you know, the lawyers create them for regulatory arbitrage or tax arbitrage, and the boards don't even know half the time uh, that it's going on. So uh, some, some governance restrictions on complexity uh, might also be uh, important. And finally, uh, derivatives, uh, you know, you're right. It, the, the complexity of it, the power of the industry behind uh, the derivatives market has really uh, hindered, uh, has, has, has resulted in a lot of very favorable treatment of, of derivatives counterparties which is in turn has insulated them from market discipline. And uh, I, uh, I, the, it is very complex. And uh, you're right, on this one, uh, you know, I think the best the public can do is if they can listen to people like me, they can listen to people in the industry and decide which way they want to go. But mm -hmm. I, I'll tell you my personal view, these bills, bills are very bad. And, uh, and uh, you should see uh, if anybody uh, who you vote for <laughs> voted for them because I, I don't think they understood it. And, you know, members of Congress really for shouldn't sure. be voting for things. And so leave this to the regulators. Because um, I, I, I trust more the regulators more than Congress, certainly, when it comes to derivatives regulation. Uh, so uh, I think uh, that, that uh, again, the complexity uh, obfuscates political accountability as well. But nonetheless, I think these instruments are very real dangerous to system stability, and, and the Main Street should know about them. Thank you.